It's October 7th, 2022 at precisely 9.56 a.m., and I'm calling it. The race for a humanoid robot is already over. Let's take a look. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. So first of all, this was also from AI Day. This was the less popular shirt because it was sort of a repeat of last year's shirt, but we managed to pick up two different versions. So we've got the hands in the white and the dojo computer in the black. So that's pretty cool. So anyway, this is a little Tesla themed merch there. I just wanted to point that out quickly. But on to the topic du jour. You're probably thinking to yourself, wait, what in the world did I say in the cold open intro about the race for a humanoid robot being over? It's just starting. We're just in like the early innings or maybe the players are just warming up before the game even starts. So how can this whole thing be over? Well, that's something I've been thinking about. Today is exactly a week after Tesla's AI day number two, and I've had a week to sort of mull over things. I'm doing a chat with Tesla Herbert later today, so definitely check out his channel when that comes out because that'll be pretty cool. But anyway, I was listening to his talk with James Dalma from back in August, prior to AI day, of course, and they were talking about the humanoid robot and somehow all of a sudden things started to crystallize crystallize in my mind, and I started to think to myself, wait a second, the hard part of this all has already been accomplished, and the rest is just refinement. So I'm going to go over the hardware, the software, and the data, and kind of take a big picture moment and look at this stuff. I've been digging into details lately in other videos, and you can check those out. They're really, really cool, and I love doing the detail videos. I'm going to do several more, hopefully one for tomorrow's video. But I think it's also worth once in a while just stepping back and looking at the big picture and thinking to yourself, wait a second, what is this looking like in the big picture, not the little details. So in other words, don't lose the forest for the trees. So what is the big picture and why is a robot that could barely walk on its own and do a little slow motion like this kind of thing or something? Why is that telling me that the race is already won and it's all just cleaning up the details at this point? Well, let's start on the hardware side. While nothing looks particularly spectacular at the moment, the version, you know, 2.0, not the Bumble C version, which is the one that has all the lights and the very bare bones skeleton and the made with off the shelf parts, but the next version of Optimus, they didn't really give it a name, but maybe Bumble D, I don't know, <laughs> just give it, give it a name. But anyway, it's designed with custom made actuators and actuators are the most difficult part mechanically for robotics. That's an incredibly difficult thing to manufacture. And the problem is that companies in the past have never had the kind of money, like most robotics companies, you know, they operate on a thin budget and they only have a budget of maybe a million dollars a year for research or just, you know, arbitrary but it's, it's a relatively small budget. But when you have a large company like Tesla and one with incredible manufacturing prowess and history, they can provide not only the money to build these new actuators, but also the facilities and the technical know-how to do this. This is something that most other companies, including companies like Boston Dynamics, that mostly have to work with off-the-shelf parts simply can't do. So why are custom actuators so darn important? Well, it's actually similar to this, my iPhone here. This is an iPhone 13. So that's 2021 was that was made. And if you go back to 2007, when the original iPhone came out, that was made with mostly off the shelf parts. So it was kind of clunky. It had relatively low battery life. It had relatively low specifications, performance abilities, and things like that. What's happened over the years is that Apple and other companies like Samsung, et cetera, have built more and more custom designed things purpose built just for the iPhone or the Galaxy or whatever the competition is. So as they build these very specific parts, they're able to leverage economies of scale, but also create things that are specifically designed for what's going on in the phone. And what's happening here is with robotics, robotics have pretty much all been built with off the shelf stuff because you didn't have the economies of scale to make it worthwhile to build these custom things. Tesla, of course, even though these actuators are probably millions of dollars each at this point because of, not because of the materials, but because of the cost of the engineering research and the tools that you have to use to make them. So they're very, very expensive right now, but Tesla's planning on making millions to hundreds of millions of these robots. So the cost will be amortized over a ton of these things, and they'll eventually be cheap enough that it's worth their while to build these things custom. And as it turns out, custom actuators, or these are motors, they're very, very specific types of motors. They need to operate at low speed with very, very high torque and really, really low latency. And that's an interesting combination of things. Most motors that we have that we're used to having around us operate at relatively high speed with low torque. That's how they get away with things. And so what you do is you gear it down if you want it to run slow, 
Foley or something like that. But of course you've got Tesla motors. Tesla's motors inside their vehicles have to operate from zero hertz, in other words, standing still to many, many, many hertz as you're driving a vehicle at 100 miles an hour potentially or more than that. So Tesla has the experience, the material science, the know-how about electromagnetic fields and flux and all of that kind of stuff to build motors that are very, very accurate and they can operate at very, very low speeds, low hertz, in other words, low rotational speeds at very, very high torque. And that's exactly what you need for actuators. And so what you saw during AI day when they were showing those custom made actuators and then when I got a chance to look at the prototype bot when I was taking a picture, these are big, chunky, solid actuators that they have on the large parts of the body. And then of course they have smaller ones in the hands and stuff too. Speaking of hands, that's the other big thing is that most robotics companies have either done a hand all by itself, so you can look at OpenAI and they created a hand, but it's just a hand all by itself. Or they've created bipedal robots with basically fists for hands, or maybe just a gripper with two fingers or something. Very, very primitive hands. Hands are incredibly complicated. Us human beings have amazingly dexterous hands. Obviously, that's a big deal for us. And one of the reasons why we're very successful, because we can manipulate tools. And a humanoid robot, in order to be a drop-in replacement for a human being, has to have dexterous hands, but only up to a point. And what Tesla's done is they've pared down exactly what it means to be a human hand and what's necessary. And it turns out what's necessary is to put the actuators into the palm of the hand and then have cables that run throughout the fingers and you basically rotate it down and the fingers just have a sort of predefined curling motion that they do. And then you have that for the thumb and also another one that goes like this as well. Sorry, let's see if we could do like that. Anyway, so you only have to have six actuators inside the hand, which you can then fit inside the hand so you don't have to have cables running down the arm, which makes things much more clean and uncomplicated in terms of the way this all works. And yes, this means Tesla bot is not going to be able to play the piano or probably any instrument, and it won't be able to manipulate things like chopsticks and stuff that require a lot of dexterity at the ends of your fingers, but it will have the ability to grip power tools, which in the version 1.0 of the Tesla bot is the most important thing. So on the hardware front, essentially what Tesla has done is they've just jumped from nowhere to the front of the pack for all of this stuff and essentially shown that these are solved problems at this point. Yes, there's always going to be refinement and you can make things better and you can make human hands that are much more dexterous than the ones that are in Tesla bot. But at this point for a functional robot that can do many, many useful tasks, they've solved the problem and that's pretty remarkable. Next up is software, and that's something where robotics teams have labored for years. Again, listening to James Dalma talk, it was, it was making me think about the comparison between full self-driving and the Tesla robot. And full self-driving, Tesla really launched into it about a decade ago, 2013, 2014, I think it was 2013, that they were actually doing factory work. And they weren't doing it for full self-driving yet, but they were doing vision-based systems inside their factory for digital self-management, which of course I've done videos about as as well. But basically they were betting the pot on neural networks right after they sort of made a huge resurgence in 2012. So really, really remarkable that they were able to have the perspicacity to see at that point where neural networks could potentially go. Obviously it was a very, very large risk because 10 years ago or nine years ago, neural networks were not nearly as capable as they are now and things could have just leveled out, but they didn't, much to the good fortune of Tesla. And so they've been able to manufacture full self-driving, they've been able to engineer it, they've been able to come up with a solution that works remarkably well under a basically unconstrained world, right? Anything can happen in the real world, especially out on roads and things like that. And full self-driving is able to deal with, let's say, 98 or 99 percent of that. There is still some stuff it can't deal with, but basically it's almost a solved problem on the roads at high velocities. So what happens with a robot that's moving in a much more constrained environment? Again, remember, we're talking about factories and stuff at the beginning. It doesn't have to operate in an unconstrained environment. It doesn't have to operate at high velocities. It doesn't have to do any of that stuff. So essentially, Tesla Bot's job is much easier than a car's job. Everything is reduced in complexity in terms of navigating it and understanding the world because it has so much more time. Now, of course, the other side of that equation is that Tesla Bot has to balance itself 
itself. It has to walk on two legs. It has to be able to move fingers in a very dexterous manner. It has to do all of that kind of stuff that a car doesn't have to, right? The control system, the output of a car is super simple. It's brake, accelerate, and turn. That's it. There's literally three controls for a car to operate in the world. A humanoid robot has to have many, many, many more controls. It has to be able to move its arms in three-dimensional space. It has to be able to stand upright. It has to be able to walk at a reasonable pace. It has to be able to utilize its fingers in a very, very careful manner. It has to understand this stuff, right? It has to be able to sense feedback and everything. So there's a ton of stuff that a robot has to deal with on the control side of things that a car doesn't. But in terms of the vision and sensing and input side of things, it's much, much simpler than a car is. And once again, with Tesla having mostly solved full self-driving at this point, they've really solved the full self-driving or full autonomy for Tesla bot because again, it has so much more room for error. It doesn't have to be nearly as exact and nearly as safe as full self-driving. And it's in a much more constrained environment at the beginning. Again, factory, very, very straightforward environment. Yeah, there's a lot of chaos going on, but the lighting is generally the same. The floors are flat. Things are well demarcated. You know, there's a lot of that stuff that you just don't get in the real world. There's a lot of things that happen in the real world that aren't going to happen in a factory. Now, obviously, as Tesla bot is shipped to people's houses and to other factories and potentially walking down the street and stuff, it is going to have to expand its range of capabilities and understanding of the world. But the beginning process is going to be much simpler than dealing with full self-driving. So we've got hardware and software, now we come to data. And this is something where a lot of people are like, there's no way that this can work because you've got billions of miles that are being driven in full self-driving by human beings. That's data that Tesla can collect and they can utilize that to train their full self-driving. And yes, that is very, very true. But the interesting thing about this is you have to think about something like GPT-3 versus Dolly 2. So GPT-3 is Generative Pre-Trained Transformers number three. It's got 174 billion parameters and it was trained on an unconstrained world of internet. They just fed it all of the internet. <laughs> they said, here's all the, the words from the internet, learn. And it learned that stuff. This is kind of like what full self-driving is doing. It's like, go out into the world and suck in all the data that the people are driving around, you know, take all of that data and turn it into useful stuff and train on it. Then what you've got from OpenAI as opposed to GPT-3 is Dolly 2, which is a more refined version of GPT-3 with image-based stuff added on. And it's able to create pictures and do very, very creative things. And this is a much more constrained problem, but it feeds from GPT-3. So you take unconstrained, you learn all the neural network weights, you learn how to do all of this stuff on unconstrained data, tons and tons of data, and then you can use a much, much smaller data set and constrain it and teach it to do something very, very specific. So Optimus is in the same sort of situation. You've got full self-driving, which was an unconstrained problem. You just fed it all this data, and then you train the networks to do a really, really good job. And then what you can do is you can take those networks that are pre-trained and you can repurpose them. You can fine tune them for more specific things that are going on. So you don't need nearly as much data to do the second thing as you needed to do the first thing. You needed trillions of words or billions of miles to do the first thing, to train up these basic neural networks, figure out the architectures, get the weights properly set and all of that kind of stuff. And then you can fine tune it using much, much, much smaller data sets for Optimus and for working in the factory and eventually for working in the home. And one more thing to add to the data puzzle is that Tesla has built an incredible simulator. It's being used to train full self-driving for situations that they don't want to put the car into for real, like potentially hitting people or having accidents or things like that. So it's a simulator and it's an excellent simulator. And guess what? You can put Tesla bot in there too, right? You could put it on the same city streets and have it walk around in simulation, but you can also build factories and you can put it inside the factories and have it walk around in there too. Now, of course, simulation is not going to get you to 100% of the way there. You are going to have to use real physical world data, but you can get, I don't know, 90% of the way there. You can get very, very close using an excellent simulator and having the robot operate in there. Let's say 80% to be generous. But anyway, you can get like four-fifths of the way to where you need to go simply using simulation, and you can make an infinite number of simulations, and you can run them very, very rapidly. And then that last 20%, you don't need so much data, you don't need so much much time, 
and you can leverage all of the work that's been done previously to set all of the weights properly. Remember at heart, neural networks are just tiny dials that you're spinning and you're just moving them ever so slightly in all these different directions. It's just that when you have millions or billions of these tiny little knobs, you can actually do amazing real world things. So essentially Tesla bot, by the time it gets to real world training, is just trying to tweak these numbers just a teeny bit. It's not having to train any of this stuff from scratch anymore. And so when you think about hardware, software, and data, the fact that Bumble C was able to walk out on stage, do its little thing like that, turn around and walk back without falling over was huge. Yes, it's not doing what Boston Dynamics is doing, but it's doing it in a completely different way. That's the important thing. It's using neural networks from the ground up to be able to train itself to do this stuff. And neural networks have amazing headroom. So as you add more data, as you add more training, as you create better actuators and better hardware that it can work with and better sensors for it to understand the world, the sky's the limit, right? It just basically is going to go exponential. So I'm predicting by next year, we're going to see something that's incredibly useful and probably we'll see them in the factories before them doing useful tasks. So that's why I'm saying even though it's the end of 2022 and it seems like we're decades away from a useful humanoid robot, we're basically already there. It's just something where it has to be refined and it has to be able to be manufactured at inexpensive cost per robot. And those are all questions of refinement, not questions of fundamental research anymore. It's pretty amazing to think about this stuff and I hope you agree with me. All right, I hope you enjoyed this episode and found it fun and interesting and thought provoking. <laughs> I certainly found it thought provoking to think about it. Anyway, if you did, please do like the video so other people can find it and also consider subscribing for more of this kind of content. As always, a huge shout out to my patrons on Patreon. Thank you all so much for your support. I truly do appreciate it. And if you're interested in a whole bunch of really cool merch, check out our merch store. Link is in the description. We have TeslaBot t-shirts, the Tesla meme t-shirt, success is a possible outcome, 4680 battery cells. All of that stuff is on t-shirts, mugs, tumblers, and on and on. So check it out. And for those of you interested in investing, check out Webull, an amazing platform for buying and selling stocks, and now cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Dogecoin, and others. Open an account and get a free stock valued at up to $200, and fund your account and get another free stock valued at up to $1,600. Check out the link in the description and help the channel at the same time. Thank you. And one other thing for my Patreon patrons and anybody else who's in the Florida area, I'm going to be down at TeslaCon Florida on October 21st and 22nd. So definitely come say hi to me if you're in the area. And finally, don't forget we are both Tesla and Amazon affiliates. If you look in the description, you can see how going shopping for a solar roof, a power wall, or anything on Amazon helps out the channel. In the meantime, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.